Good morning, afternoon, and evening, everyone, wherever you all are. Welcome to this webinar of the highlights of the 2023 International Invasive Lobular Carcinoma Symposium, which took place in September in Pittsburgh. I'm Lori Hutchison, the Executive Director of the Lobular Breast Cancer Alliance and a five-year survivor of early stage lobular breast cancer. Um, and I'm going to turn it over now to my fellow advocate, Claire Turner, to get us started. Thank you, everyone, and welcome from around the world. Um, as Laurie said, my name is Claire Turner. I'm the I'm a um, patient advocate, and I was diagnosed with lobular breast cancer in 2017. And I'm a co-founder and chair of Lobular Breast Cancer UK. We're delighted to welcome you today to some of the highlights of this year's ILC Symposium. And I hope that we capture some of the energy and the real commitment that came from the clinicians, researchers and patient advocates to tackle the challenges that we face uh, following a lobular breast cancer diagnosis. Um, I hope as well for you that are listening that have had an ILC diagnosis that you, you take away some real understanding and clinical information that can help you with your conversations in clinic um, when you're having discussions about treatment. So I'm just gonna hand back to Laurie to fill you in with the agenda that we have for you today. Wonderful, thanks, Claire. So I'm now gonna walk us quickly through the agenda and then we'll hear from our first panelists. Please note, uh, this is being recorded and this will be posted later um, on the LBCA and the ILC Symposium website. Um, so we'll make you aware of that when, it, when it's ready. Um, we're planning to have 15 minutes after all panelists have spoken for a Q&A. And you'll note that you'll be able to write questions and submit them to us on the Q&A platform. Um, and we encourage you to do so throughout the webinar. There are a lot of you attending um, and we'll try to get to as many as we receive at the end um, and may have some extra time to do so. Um, uh, our panelists were all participants in the symposium in September, and we are very grateful to them for sharing their insights with us today. As they share the key research they've chosen to highlight, we have asked them to note uh, the researchers and the sessions from the symposium that are being referenced, because those recordings from those sessions are still going to be available, um, I think, coming soon. Uh, we'll hear from Drs. Patrick Dirksen and Peter Simpson first, presenting the highlights of the basic science in a brief 20 minutes. Next, Dr. Bhuvaneswari Ramaswamy will be sharing the highlights of the translational science um, in about 15 minutes, followed by Dr. Matthew Covington, who will discuss imaging takeaways in 15 minutes. And last but not least, we will hear from Dr. Priscilla McAuliffe, who will discuss highlights from the clinical science presentations. Dr. Jason Moabi, Claire, and I will moderate the Q&A session at the end. So without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce our first two panelists who will be speaking about the basic ILC science discussed at the symposium. And we'll be starting with um, Peter Simpson. Uh, Dr. Peter Simpson, Associate Professor at University of Queensland Center for Clinical Research, holds a joint teaching and research position where he's head of the cancer theme and a research group leader at UQCCR. He's a senior lecturer in the discipline of pathology where he teaches on the Faculty of Medicine MD program. Dr. Simpson holds a BS Bachelor's of Science honors degree and a PhD in molecular biology from the University of Liverpool in the UK. He moved to Australia in 2005 and helped Professor Lakhani establish the Molecular Breast Pathology Group and the Brisbane Breast Bank Peter has a longstanding interest in understanding the molecular factors that cause breast cancer development and progression, especially in the context of invasive lobular breast cancer. Dr. Patrick Dirksen of the University Medical Center Utrecht, Netherlands, Department of Pathology, is a molecular cancer biologist focused on cell adhesion receptors and how they control invasive breast cancer. During his postdoctoral research, he was the first to demonstrate a causal link between loss of adhesion between ductal breast cells and the development of ILC. 
He has a strong track record in mouse and human models of metastatic breast cancer. Based on these tools, his group is working hard to better understand the biochemical wiring of lobular cancer cells to develop effective targeted interventions. And I would like to now turn it over to the two of you. Thank you. Good, good morning, everybody. Um, hopefully you can hear me. Um, so it's a pleasure to be here uh, this morning for us and a special shout out to everybody else who uh, will need lots of coffee to get through the rest of the day as we uh, start this session about 1.30 1 in the morning down in Australia. Um, so uh, Patrick and I have the, uh, the pleasure of covering the basic science talks that kicked off the meeting in uh, September. And actually, base, basic science is a funny term. It's anything but basic, um, some very complex science that goes on uh, to understanding disease and really forms the foundation of um, clinical interventions that come, come later on. So, so these are the three sessions that we are going to, going to be covering um, relating to pathology, e adhering and the microenvironment and models of invasive lobular carcinoma. I'll actually move my slide. Oh, there we go. Thank you. Um, so there are five talks in the first session. And actually, this isn't really basic science either. It's a very important clinical um, discipline of pathology um, because without pathology, we don't have invasive lobular carcinoma. We don't have a formal diagnosis. And therefore, we don't really have a, 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 a management program for patients. So this is all about pathology where um, the tumor is diagnosed um, under the microscope. And we have Stuart Schnitt, who is um, a pathologist and gave the Lee Pate Memorial Lecture on lobular breast cancer. Terry King, who gave an overview, a fantastic overview of lobular carcinoma in situ. And we have Maxim Deschepa, who gave another pathology diagnosis to try and improve, think of ways to improve the classification of disease. And we had two um, talks which were selected from abstracts looking at pathology and, uh, and, and science um, together. It, it's quite an, a, a nice way to introduce this webinar this morning with, um, with pathology because it helps us to illustrate the natural history of disease. And, and this is what we mean by the natural history of disease. So we have normal cells in the terminal duct lobular unit of the breast, which become transformed with mutations in different genes, but in particular into e cadherin which is a very important molecule, as we probably all know with lobular carcinomas. As the cells start to proliferate with these mutations, a small lesion is called um, atypical lobular hyperplasia, and this exists within the terminal duct lobular unit. As this lesion becomes larger, it's called lobular carcinoma in situ. And when the cells that represent this lesion break through, through, through the basement membrane of, of that ductal structure, then it starts, the cells start to invade into the underlying stroma. And this is where we call it invasive lobular carcinoma. There's a low power view here of um, the pathology of what this might look like down the microscope. And this area is represented, um, this area represents lobular carcinoma in situ where the cells are confined in the ductal structure and when these cells break free and start growing and invading through the tissue, it's called the invasive lobular carcinoma. This is a high power view looking at the, um, th this region of tissue where we can see these are the cells that are invading through the stroma. And this is what we call the invasive tumor. So um, I'm gonna kind of merge a few of the talk, the first three talks together because we're um, covering some um, important aspects about this natural history of disease. So Terry King gave this wonderful overview of LCIS and Stuart and Maxim talked about classification and, and challenges in the diagnostic process. We, we then had these two science talks. So Lorne's Gerudi um, talked about the biology of the stroma around the tissue and so around the tumor. And so this is the component of a stroma which is interacting with the tumor cells 
uh, as they grow and invade through the cancer, through the through the tissue. And then Osama Shah gave a very complex um, multi-omic um, analysis of tumors which have a duct or lobular carcinoma um, growth pattern. So this is a complex morphological um, variant of uh, of breast breast cancer which shows both lobular carcinoma features and ductal carcinoma features. So the natural history of disease, um, it follows this um, linear pattern in, in some cases, and, and we call this um, the, perhaps the default uh, process um, leads to the formation of this classic invasive lobular carcinoma. So the majority of cancers in this group are grade two estrogen receptor positive HER2 negative and have a low proliferative index. But we know from much research over, over many years that the, the natural history is actually a lot more complex than this, and it causes quite a few clinical challenges um, with managing patients and understanding disease. So we know that not all lobular carcinoma in situ lesions progress to invasive cancer. Some of them just get stuck at this stage. So how do we predict whether a, a lesion that's identified in a biopsy is going to have invasive lobular carcinoma in, a, in an excision, excision spe specimen or, or progresses to invasive cancer in, in time? Some of these lesions also have morphological features that don't look like classic lobular carcinoma in situ. And so how do we manage them? Invasive lobular carcinoma can also be difficult to classify. And there's some data to show that there's um, significant challenges in, in this process. Um, and so we, we need to try and understand the tools that can help classify lobular carcinoma when it's not classic type. So how do we identify these rogue variants? So I'll start with talking about lobular carcinoma in situ because it comes first in this natural history. Um, so we know this is a risk lesion of, uh, of the patient developing invasive cancer. The risk can be um, around 2% per, per year. So of those patients that might go on to develop invasive cancer, it might be a small proportion, a small risk of about 2% per year uh, uh, over subsequent years. We also know that the risk is not just for lobular cancer, although it's higher for lobular cancer, but also for ductal types of cancer. And the risk is also more likely in the same breast that the LCIS was diagnosed, but it can also be in the contralateral breast. So we know that uh, this data suggests that it's, a, it's an important risk lesion, um, um, but, but it can be not just for invasive lobular carcinoma, but for other things. We also know that lobular carcinoma in situ is genetically very similar, if not identical, to invasive lobular carcinoma. So this tells us that it's a direct, um, but not, but a non-obligate precursor to cancer. So these kind of things give us a bit of a conundrum on how to manage, um, particularly when LCIS is identified in a biopsy. How do we take into account all of these um, pieces of information in terms of managing the patients? Well, fortunately, there's a lot of data now that um, um, we can use to help gu guide management. And patients no longer need to undergo things like very dramatic things like bilateral mastectomy or mastectomy. The rates of these procedures is, is extremely small now and, and surgical excision um, to look for concurrent invasive carcinoma um, it is more normal. But data from, also data from uh, Tari King's lab suggests that, in fact, maybe surgical excision isn't completely necessary in this study from, from their um, center, which involved 127 patients. All those that had excision, none of them had invasive cancer in the specimen. And in following the patients up for subsequent years, only five of them developed invasive uh, cancer and these five were all unrelated to the biopsied um, LCIS. So, so we know actually that the risk of progression is, is quite small. So some of the key points from this, um, so patients who have a diagnosis of classic lobular carcinoma in a biopsy, only select patients need excision. Many patients can be managed um, 
well with perhaps chemo prevention and imaging as part of observational trials. Variants of LCIS which show pleomorphic features, the natural history is less clear and, and probably these need to be treated like patients with DCIS with excision and clear margins. So Stuart Snitt and Maxim de Schepper talked about classification. Again, this is done down the microscope and, and a correct classification is critical for many reasons, including those listed, um, but in particular for correct clinical management. But we know this is really challenging for a number of cases and there's quite some variability in classification worldwide by patho pathologists. So these uh, two pathologists talked about some helpful tools that help, um, which can be implemented to help classify the disease correctly. And these are in recognizing morphological variants using immunistic chemistry and artificial intelligence. So there's a few um, morphological variants listed uh, shown on the screen and they show various um, different types of growth pattern or cytological features of individual cells in these cancers. And they look different to the classic lobular carcinoma type, and so sometimes can be difficult to classify. Stuart talked about a variant which is recently described where these individual lobular carcinoma cells secrete a lot of mucin into the surrounding uh, microenvironment, so they are a bit like a mucinous carcinoma of the breast with this elaborate mucin production. It's a rare variant, but it's important to recognize because it seems like it has a poor outcome. So collectively, these morphological variants have a worse prognosis to classic type, but there's not really enough data yet to manage patients differently at the moment. And then there are these other rogue variants of lobular carcinoma, which are really important to, to recognize at diagnosis. Uh, and I think there's some really exciting um, methods for, for treating some of these patients. So some of these tumors can be grade three, or so they have a higher proliferative index. Some are estrogen receptor or progesterone receptor negative or triple negative. Some of them are HER2 positive, and some of them are this new classification called HER2 low, um, which is quite a high proportion, and these have quite good um, potential for treatment with HER2 targeted therapies. And Patrick will talk about soon, um, he'll talk about some studies looking at HER2 mutations, which are, are more common in lobular carcinomas. And again, these have some exciting therapeutic opportunities. So also immunohistochemistry is going to be an, an important adjunct tool at classification. It's already undertaken for ER, PR and HER2 at diagnosis. Um, staining for e adherin is particularly um, challenging to score, except when um, tumors are completely positive. This is the brown staining for e adherin or completely negative, which is what most lobular carcinomas um, display. But there's these um, aberrant, st aberrant staining patterns where we can see some staining and it's not quite clear what the, um, the, the kind of the biology behind this staining might be or how it might impact clinical management. But it, it seems like it just going through the staining process will help the classification of lobular carcinomas. We sometimes all get a bit afraid of artificial intelligence, but I, I think it's a really exciting space for the future in medical science and, and in managing patients. And, and in particularly pathology and in fact radiology lends itself very well to artificial intelligence um, where, where we can help the computer and train the computer to analyze um, tissue sections of cancer to help make a classification. And, and Stuart Schnitt talked about these two studies that have both used artificial intelligence and, and, and both studies through training of the computer have, have come out with, with very sensitive methods for classifying invasive lobular carcinoma. So I think these tools are gonna to be really useful in the future for, for helping um, in the classification and diagnostics for invasive lobular carcinoma. I'll finish quickly by talking about two um, studies that were um, presented um, both from abstract um, submissions, both very hardcore, um, complex biology um, uh, uh, using path pathology and, and, and clinical specimens. So Asama Shah talked about a multi-omic profiling 
um, analysis to build up a lot of molecular data on understanding the disease. So we know what genomic profiling is, I think, um, which is where we study gene mutations to understand how the cancer's growing and arising. Spatial transcriptomics and single cell profiling is where we look at the RNA, and that gives us a good idea um, of, of the biology of the cancer cells. And Lawrence Giroudi also used single cell profiling. And, and in this study, he didn't actually look at the cancer cells themselves, but looked at stromal tissue. And hopefully you can appreciate from this, this image. So each individual spot here is an individual cell that has been sequenced. But there is a different pattern of these cancer associated fibroblasts in invasive lobular carcinomas compared to invasive ductal carcinomas. And it's the same for some sequencing of immune cell types. So this sort of information is really helping us to understand that the biology of lobular carcinoma is quite different to that of invasive ductal carcinoma. And with that, I'll move on to Patrick. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Pete. Um, I will do the speakers one by one of the session uh, two, which uh, was called the Cohering Growth Factors and the ILC Tumor Microenvironment. I'll do a very brief recap of quite some different subjects and really complex uh, biology. So the first uh, speaker was um, me. And let's see if I can. So I did the first uh, talk and I talked about how you could hear into effect in linkage can reveal candidate tumor suppressors in lobular breast cancer. So you could hear is essential for the binding between two epithelial cells, which you can see on the left. If you could hear is lost, cells can no longer correctly control the cell skeleton called effectin. And because you could hear loss of function is the main driver of ILC, but only 60% of ILC samples of you hear mutant uh, we wondered if we could find alternative drivers in patient samples that were eager here in wild type. And out of the 308 potential mutations, we selected a fedin, which is a gene that is involved in connecting eager here into the skeleton of the cell called F actin. A fedin was then knocked out in eager here in positive breast cancer cell lines and a breast cancer organoid model and transplanted in the memory ducts of mice, which showed that loss of a fedin is indeed a new. ILC tumor suppressor gene that underpins e in positive ILC. And you can see that on the right. So knocking out a fedin leads to these invasive ILC typical strands. Uh, and the model is that a fedin loss confers binding of e to the cytoskeleton. And that's why it's important. And I finished by proposing a model that stratifies ILC based on the biology and function defining classical e mutant and non-classical ILC that retain expression of a non-functional e protein. So classical ILC will have lost e altogether and is e mutant, and non-classical ILC will have expressed and will still express e but it will be aberrant and non-functional. So the next talk was by Val Brunton. Um, she is at the Edinburgh Cancer Center and she talked about cancer associated fibroblasts in the ILC microenvironment. So Val's work investigates how a particular healthy cell type called cancer associated fibroblasts influences the behavior of lobular breast cancer cells. Now Val's group identified two proteins called IL-6 and PEP-A which are secreted by these carcinoma associated fibroblasts and are detected at higher levels in lobular than in ductal tumors, which is what you can see on the right side of the slide. They found that high levels of PEPE are associated with poorer outcomes in, in ER positive breast cancer. And they also showed that CAPS secrete IL-6, a growth hormone that switches on genes in lobular tumor cells and causes more lobular tumor cells to spread around in a zebrafish embryo model, which you can see on the right, and suggesting it promotes lobular the tumor cell metastases. Next speaker was Thijs Korman uh, from the UMC Medical Center in Utrecht. And he talked about how you can target survival cues to treat lobular breast cancer in a preclinical setting. So Thijs showed that loss of VCAT here in ILC leads to the activation of a transcriptional Kaiso program called CART, which underpins the slow growth of ILC and hyperactivation of growth factor receptors that drive survival of metastasizing cells. So on the left, you can see basically the two things biochemically that happen if e is lost. 
Tay showed that Ecoherin loss through activation of CART causes a vulnerability for cell cycle inhibitors, which you can see on the right. So quite counterintuitively, if you lose Ecoherin, the cell grows slower, but is very susceptible to CDK4-6 inhibition. Now this finding was combined with the established vulnerability for ILC towards inhibition of AKT. And indeed combined therapy in cell lines show synergy for two drugs in ILC, which you can see on the right, but not for IDC, which you can see on the left. So the blue color indicates synergy between the two drugs, epotacitib, which targets AKT on the top and CDK4-6 palbosiclib, which are on the left side of the, of the screen. Uh, in mouse models, Tay showed that dual intervention shows very much promise uh, in inhibiting relapses. So what you can see here is that the, the drugs both work very well in both IDC on the left and ILC on the right, but only in ILC, it is able to completely inhibit relapses in this mouse model of breast cancer. So the general idea of this model is to use this two-hit strategy to stop awoken metastasized ILC cells from dividing with CDK4-6 inhibitors and then subsequently kill ILC cells with an AKT drug in a clinical trial. Next speaker was Ariella Hanker from UT Southwestern, and she talked about the therapeutic targeting of HER2 driver mutations in ILC, which Pete already mentioned in his talk. So activating mutations in the HER2 gene are found in about 10 to 20% of all ILCs. A drug called neratinib is very effective against these specific HER2 changes, while others like trastuzumab don't work that well. So a study called the SUMMIT trial found that using neratinib, trastuzumab, and another drug called Volvestrin together was very, very successful in treating advanced HER2 mutant breast cancers, including ILC, which is what you can see on this slide. And because of these positive results, the NCCN guidelines now recommend this treatment for patients with advanced HER2 mutant breast cancers following progression on CDK4-6 inhibitors. Ariella's lab has been looking into why some HER2 mutant breast cancers become resistant to treatment and how resistance can be overcome. And they are planning a clinical trial for stage one to three hormone receptor positive HER2 mutant ILC to determine whether using neratinib along with endocrine treatment, can make the treatment work better. Ariella was proposing the use of targeted drugs for early-stage ILCs that have an actionable mutation beyond HER2 to reduce the chance of recurring mutations. Next talk was from Renat Jeselson. She's from the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute in Boston, and she was talking about a unique chromatin state that can drive therapeutic resistance in lobular breast cancer. So Renat's work focuses on epigenetic regulation and the differences between IDC and ILC. She looks at motifs, which are active DNA sites, which are enriched in ILC, and those include four, several forecat transcription factors, which are called FOXA1. So she showed that the enriched FOXA1 binding in ILC is associated with worse outcomes, specifically in luminal A ILC type cancers. So follow-up research identified, I'm going too fast, excuse me. So follow-up research uh, identified a FOXA1 binding site on the DNA, which you can see on the left side, that might represent a super enhancer, which is a region that can hyperactivate several genes. They then used a genetic tool called CRISPR to knock out the FOXA1 DNA region, which they did on the right. And you can see that indeed several target genes are reduced in expression. And also there's an indication of a proliferative, so a growth defect in the knockout cells, which you can see on the bottom right. So in summary, Renat proposed that ILC cells uniquely depend on FOXA1 dependent and a super enhancer driven transcriptional program that underpins high risk luminal A and tamoxifen resistant ILC, which may offer options for future clinical intervention. So next up was the uh, keynote lecture by uh, Catherine Briskin. She is from the IFP in Lausanne in Switzerland, and she uh, presented work on a new look at lobular carcinoma development through the TEAT. And Catherine gave a very nice overview of the work done in her lab, where they use memory introduxal injections, also called MIND, of breast cancer cell lines and primary breast cancer material. So the reason for taking this approach is that MIND forces cells to go through an in-situ state. And in this way, uh, one can actually study early invasion and tumor progression of cells that look and behave like ILC cells in a live animal. 
Using these tools, uh, they identified LOX-L1, which is a lysol oxidase-like protein, which is involved in remodeling of the extracellular matrix. It can downregulate e coherence and it can regulate the proliferation and survival of cells. And her group indeed observed that ILC cells rely on LOX-L1 for growth and survival of uh, ILC cell lines and a primary patient sample using these mind mouse models. And she finished by hypothesizing that LOX-L1 controls ILC through the ECM and ER signals, so estrogen receptor dependent signals, and now focuses on developing a preclinical intervention using the LOX inhibitor PXS 5505 in a preclinical setting. The next speaker was Adrian Lee from UPMC in Pittsburgh, and he gave a wonderful talk about understanding ILC models. So Adrian presented the outcome of a very extensive and comprehensive inventory on ILC on cell line models for ILC that is now available on bioarchives, which you can see on the bottom. He started with the question on what is the definition of a lobular cell line using morphology, the coherence, genetic status, the estrogen receptor expression as a starting point. And from these analyses, he outlined the molecular subtypes based on mRNA expression, protein expression, and DNA methylation. So a very comprehensive set of techniques. Some key proteins like P120 and e coherence were assessed as well, which you can see in this slide. So next he presented data on genomic architecture and methylation spectra to further characterize these cell lines. Moreover, functional data using loss of functional experiments showed the differences between IDC and ILC cell lines and exemplified the hallmark pathways and genes in ILC, which is the cytoskeleton dynamics and growth factor receptor activation, and that nicely intertwined with data that was already published. So finally, he gave an overarching table that was, uh, pr was presented with a suggestion for applicability. And in short, this work provides a unique and very extensive inventory of all the ILC and ILC-like cell lines, which will be a great repository for basic and translational researchers. And with this, I would like to give the floor back uh, to Pete. Thanks, Patrick. Um, can you just extend the move to the next slide for me while... Oh. Um, well, I'll just mention very briefly in the interest of time, there was a couple of studies that were using these models in, in ILC um, research, including um, trying to understand resistance to mark, uh, therapeutics like CDK4 inhibitors um, and to try and understand the biology of resistance, which is important um, clinical, uh, important clinical interest um, for, for patients. And, and another another study was looking at models where we can take a sample from the patient's um, cancer specimen and um, study these in in animal models. Um, so uh, perhaps in the interest of time, I'll allow the program to move on. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick and Pete. That was that was really interesting. Um, we'll be moving on now to our next presenter, Dr. Bhuvanaswari Ramaswamy. Uh, Dr. Ramaswamy is a professor of International Internal Medicine Clinical Division of Medical Oncology College of Medicine at the Ohio State University. Dr. Ramaswamy describes herself as a physician scientist in breast cancer. She oversees her lab and works collaboratively with, collaboratively with other basic scientists and sees breast cancer patients in clinic. Her lab focuses on improving outcomes in breast cancer through addressing drug resistance and cancer prevention disparities. Her previous work identified MIR-221-222 and hedgehog pathway activation, resulting in endocrine resistance. She has a specific interest in understanding the biology of drug resistance and dormancy of invasive lobular breast cancer and identifying novel therapies to overcome this challenge. Thank you, Dr. Ramaswamy. Thank you so much. Thanks for giving me the opportunity to speak here today and certainly uh, finding some novel therapeutics and as well as improving the diagnosis and treatment of lobular cancer is definitely uh, a passion of mine. And I think they've asked me to talk about translating the basic, the extraordinary basic work that's going on. And I can just say 
that you know attending this meeting definitely gave me such amount of uh, you know a sense of uh, good feeling that there's a lot of basic science that's being done and that's so important for us to progress to the next level of translating it to the human's bench to bedside as we say okay there we go <laughs> finally this is the only disclosure i have so I know you've heard a lot about e catering and I'm sorry that I'm also bringing that up again, but maybe this will also help a little bit because it's a little bit more, um, you know, it explains things a little bit better. So what does e catering do normally? You know, this is a molecule that helps in kind of uh, having additions. That is, the cells are attached to each other in normal circumstances. And so they don't grow one over each other, even if it is a, a tissue that has a lot of cells that, you know, it's not a, a low or density amount. They all, you know, kind of attached one to each other and grow in a one fine pattern. But when CD e cadherin is uh, lost, as you can see here, then, you know, they start to grow, you know, not in mono layers, but grow on top of each other and also change in the way they move and motility. So both, you know, you have a formation of cancer as well as it changes the cancer cell motility. I do want to say that just by mutating an uh, e cadherin in cells, you can't really create a lobular cancer. So there are other factors that has to go into it to be able to make it. So it's not the only one and it's not like, the, if that is the case, it would be easier for us, us to attack it and find ways to cure it. Um, unfortunately, that's not the case. Yeah, okay, move. So we all know this OE, okay. Let me see whether I can go back. Uh, yes, I did. <laughs> okay, these are the clinical challenges and I'm sure there are more that we can talk about, but I, I just thought I'll just mention these. I'm not gonna talk a lot about the delayed late diagnosis because uh, we have Dr. Covington talk about imaging, how we can uh, you know, identify these a little bit earlier or what can we do. And as far as local therapy as well, I'm not going to talk about clinical implications at this time, but that is our problem. Can we do, you know, can we do, do we need to do more drastic surgeries with lobular cancer because they're almost always upgraded? Can we actually do limited axillary surgeries in lobular cancer? These are questions that we have to think about and, uh, you know, have more better answers because we don't really have clinical trials that just used ILC patients. And that is a big, big, big trouble we have. The other thing is the choice of endocrine therapy, um, sorry, the choice of adjuvant therapy and what is the role of oncotype? There's always this question, is oncotype really reliable in lobular cancer because it's so slow growing? So these are gonna come as lower numbers. Do they really reflect the outcome and can that include the late recurrences as well? So there is also this question and the, I think, the main thing that we're going to talk about a little bit today is about more about uh, disseminated tumor cells, dormancy, late recurrence. So really, how can we target different um, um, proteins in this in this cancer or our genomic changes in this cancer to avoid the dissemination, to avoid the dormancy and then its regrowth? And I want to say, I, I unless of course Dr. Simpson and Dirksen have different answers or others, we, we know we can kind of understand that how these cells just don't kind of grow and they get out of the primary tumor and then go and sit somewhere very quietly. But what exactly makes them change and become grow faster is still really an enigma to us. And we really need to understand these things to be able to really treat our patients better and, and have a better treatment initially itself. And um, so, oh, sorry about that. Um, I'm, I'm really focusing on these five uh, uh, talks that were given. So uh, I, instead of reading it all aloud, I know there's time uh, crunch. I'll just go through one after the other, okay? One of the key things that I want to point out though is that you know we need to understand that because we don't have as much data, so much is done with retrospective data and tissue analysis. And so that's important as you know, patients as well as those with advocates who talk to people, to, it's so important to participate in these studies. And even if it's just collecting data and your old archival tissue, it is still so important. 
So we will talk a little bit about the hereditary lobular breast cancer. You know, just just so that you understand this, that 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 ED, uh, ecadrin mutations can happen after you're born in in your body cells. That's called the somatic mutation. That of course is the most common type, just in the tumor that the ecadrin or in the breast cells, the ecadrin is uh, gets mutated and then it changes its. Uh, quality and then becomes cancer. But there is a, a, a germline mutation. That is something that you got from your parents um, that you, you're you born with the e cadrin mutation. And that puts you at risk both for uh, a type of gastric cancer as well as lobular cancer. So this is the question really is um, uh, how who should you test the genetic test that includes e cadrin so there are some guidelines that has been given that you know those who have bilateral uh, lobular cancer when they're even younger than 50, those who have once unilateral uh, lobular cancer but has a very strong family history of uh, lobular cancers and uh, less than 45 years. So um, so whenever possible, we you know BRCA one and two should be excluded, which we do with our uh, regular you know uh, genetic testing panel because. It is exclusive, mutually, mutually exclusive of CDH1 mutations. So uh, in these patients, again, what more should you do, right? Like because in BRCA1, BRCA2 mutated patients, we, we do have a different screening panel, the screening ideas, including an MRI. So what they've suggested here is, of course, you everybody needs an annual uh, digital, digital mammogram or digital mammogram is tomosynthesis, but also an ultrasound and contrast enhanced MRI. Now, often these uh, mammograms will come back as, you know, uh, heterogeneously dense or very dense. And so adding a, either an um, ultrasound or an automated breast ultrasound will also be helpful. So this is another way to look at this. So this is your normal lab view in your, in your breast. So very nicely, the architecture is so nice. And then you get something changes and there is a initial some CDH1 inhibit inhibition or it's not working as well as it should. And that's called the first hit uh, inactivation. Then there is more, uh, another hit. Hit is what we saw is a genetic injury to the cells. And uh, with the second hit, of course, is even more. But as you can see, none of these cells have broken this basement uh, uh, membrane. And here, of course, they have and they're starting to infiltrate the the uh, rest of the lobules of the breast, and that's uh, when it becomes invasive lobular carcinoma. And I know uh, Dr. Derrickson also showed this to you. And so uh, here it is to say invasive lobular can cancer classically on hematoxylin is how it looks. Uh, and this was also published by Dr. Corso, who presented that day. And then if you do the EK, this is, this is the atrophic uh, duct. And if you see, there's still a little bit of you know, e is still present there, uh, and and it has a slightly that kind of that lobule look still. But of course, all of this that's infiltrated is uh, e cadrin negative. So uh, now, Doctor Sokol, the second presentation that I'm talking about, mainly talked about how we can use all these data that we have already and the tissue that we have, or with you know, whatever you can collect in your institution that you can show that performing comprehensive genomic planning or profiling and then identifying, you know, uh, gene, genes or proteins, mainly genes that are, you know, associated with poor prognosis and then whether we can really change the outcome by targeting these genes. So he, he, he talked a little bit about and some of this are published already. Um, he did talk a little bit about loss of NF1, uh, which is one of the genes called neurofibromatosis 1, and see what it looks like from his work, which was published in 2011, that this was uh, associated with endocrine resistance in ILC. And uh, the, the interesting part is NF1 loss was also associated with high tumor mutational burden. That just means when they're doing the genomic sequencing and things, they see more number of mutations and greater than 10 is considered quite high. And these tumors may be quite responsive to immunotherapy. And so again, they're trying to figure out our uh, inhibition of this NF1 on uh, their pathway rather, and then immune checkpoint inhibitors or uh, you know immunotherapy may be more 
more uh, efficient in, in treating these cancers. Uh, in, in addition, their group also showed, and, and of course, Dr. Uh, Steffi has shown this multiple times from UPMC, how F FGFR is definitely associated with uh, resistance to endocrine therapy, but it's also more in ILC. These are seen more in ILC. So they did do a trial, <laughs> preclinical and clinical data, uh, that did show th that uh, you know there is some activity with the dovetinib, which is a FGFR inhibitor or a tyrosine kinase inhibitor. So, I mean, uh, the main reason I'm bringing all this and Dr. Sokal did a very nice job is to say that all this basic science work about trying to use this tissue and patient data has led us to figure out some of the important, you know, changes in these resistant tumors and able to attack it. Of course, not everything we try is going to be successful, but unless we try, we'll never know. So the next thing, um, uh, part of his own presentation. This was also very interesting. Uh, that was that was uh, published already. Dr. Simmons from Dana Faber was the first author, and they showed that you know ILC using the same kind of comprehensive genomic profiling. They did show that patients who had this, I mean, tumors that had this apoback uh, signature. Uh, and this is uh, shown that it's basically, you know, something that works well against our viral uh, infections and things. Um, and and so they showed that those that have the apoback signatures actually work. They didn't, those tumors didn't respond well to CDK4-6 inhibitors, but responded very well to immune therapy. So once again, the more and more participation we have in clinical trials, having separate clinical trials for ILC and even if, uh, patients, you know, including themselves, even in tissue collection studies, will actually improve uh, our ability to treat these cancers. Um, liquid biopsy. Uh, I was already told I have very little time, so I'm not going to go over this. But this is one of the greatest breakthrough we have had. We don't have to go every time biopsy or tumor. As you all know, uh, as we treat metastatic disease, they're going to evolve. You block one pathway, they're going to try to open another pathway. It's almost like a traffic, divergent ways. So uh, th this is, we had to go in and, you know, biopsy every time an invasive procedure, but with this liquid biopsy, you're able to take out the tumor DNA, the cell-free tumor DNA, and uh, you're able to actually sequence them. So what you may not know is the ER, PR, and HER2 like protein, and I'm sure we'll figure out something at some point because this is DNA, so we can't really look at that, but we are able to definitely look at the changes in the D uh, genome over treatment. So, and that has uh, led to many new treatments as well. Oh, okay. Uh, so the CTDNA, there's question whether it can be used for diagnosis of cancer. I put question mark there, it's just a tough one. It, you know, you can have, cell-free DNA in your blood, even when you don't have cancer, even if, like, for example, you have diabetes, you have, you have had, uh, you just did exercise or you've had sepsis, you've had infections. So that's why it's a little difficult, but when I think it can be very useful, like in lobular cancers and other things where you're not sure or other cancers where you're not sure it might be helpful. It's definitely helpful in monitoring response. And then we can also, like I said, uh, respond to a particular treatment and whether something is changing. And the genomics on those, like, you know, is there a mutation in PA3K or estrogen receptors or FGFR? Then we can, you know, treat the patient and the tumor with that particular specific, you know, uh, approved treatment. So it, it has very good value. Hmm. So again, trying to be as fast. So Dr. Simpson um, showed that, you know, not just using his samples in his uh, 25 uh, samples from there, as well as using these public databases, one of the big things they found, because remember I told you, we don't know whether oncotype or anything is truly prognostic of uh, uh, lobular cancers because most of, most of the patients were uh, uh, IDC patients and it is a different biology. So they looked at, you know, to figure out, could there be a different one, they, a different signature, they identified 194 gene sets, I mean, gene set, and uh, showed that it's very prognostic in ILC, and they also showed data that, you know, it is actually better than others. I'm not reading every bit of this for lack of time, but I think the next picture that will come up will show that, you know, 
very nicely the difference. But anyway, they did also see that uh, yeah, her two, her three, AKT1, DROS1 were seen more frequently in this uh, lab sig uh, or, or poorly uh, performing lobular cancers. So uh, I think we just need to confirm this. This is definitely a very good multi-gene predictor of outcome, and we just need to do the larger study and pro uh, prospective studies to be able to prove this. So this is, if you see that here, so I don't want to again go over the whole thing, but this is the lob six signature, as you can see, I guess I can use my, yeah, lob six signature. This is the cohort that is used, that is whether it is metabolic or what uh, the data says, and then um, the outcomes and the other other genomic indexes. So basically this, this signature seems to be doing better than everything else. But of course we have to remember these are all retrospective cohorts and um, comes with that problem. Now, and lastly that I'm gonna to touch on is gonna be the post part. Oh my God, I work on breastfeeding and <laughs> those impact on mice. I wrote postpartum, I'm very sorry about that. Uh, so postmortem tissue donation program. And this was very nicely discussed by Dr. Van Buren because she was talking about, you know, she used this clinical trial and then, you know, so within a certain time, she was able to, you know, at, at the rate of about one per month, it doesn't really matter, but they're able to collect a lot of amount of tum a tumor for future purposes. They have developed actually patient-derived organoids, which is such an important thing to be able to do. And she's also seen that um, some of those, when you kind of, this is something, you, you know, you all I know face like, you know, there's hardly any tumor, but then when you go and look into specific areas like a bowel wall and things, there's a lot of tumor. So which was not visible before, which was not in the clinical, you know, uh, uh, notes before, which means that we need better kind of tests uh, that we can identify these tumors that go in certain rare places as well. So I, I think this is something that I know UPMC has a very good program and they have done very well. I think it should be something that should be done everywhere because this is uh, definitely a very useful uh, for, for the future. Um, so that, uh, just, just a summary of what I just said. So um, what can we all do? So I think advocacy is very important. What you're all doing is just amazing. I mean, it is just so impressive what you're doing so that there's more awareness, there's more, even among us, as scientists and clinicians, we understand the, the, what the challenges we meet. I think continuing to do more basic research, particularly on dormancy and identifying therapeutic targets is important patients being more in clinical trials and we creating more clinical trials that are unique for ILC patients. And also um, we we should, I think we should talk to and say, I'm not sure about this, whether ILC is now considered a rare tumor so that I know approval to all these trials will be slow and we will not be blamed for that. And industry should focus on this ILC after all, it's as much as a triple negative you know, population. So I don't know why they don't focus on this. And of course, we want more and more funding agency to recognize this is such an important research for our patients. So um, I thank you all for your attention. And I always believe there should be equity and access and, and uh, education and resources so that everybody can touch that finish line. So thank you for your time. Thanks so much, Dr. Ramaswamy. That was great. And thanks for that uh, last just takeaway slide on what we can do. I want to reiterate your plug for ILC patients to participate in studies of all sorts. Um, I also want to note that uh, we will be able to share these slides when we post the recording um, and we can make some corrections on them before we do. Um, and uh, it's now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Matthew Covington, who will be discussing the imaging science that was presented at the symposium. Dr. Matthew Covington is a radiology subspecialist in breast imaging and nuclear radiology, appointed as an assistant professor at the Center for Quantitative Cancer Imaging at the Huntsman Cancer Institute. 
and the Department of Radiology and Imaging Sciences at the University of Utah. Dr. Covington has been a principal investigator or co-investigator on multiple clinical trials evaluating new and emerging imaging technologies, including 18F fluorestradiol FES PET CT for evaluation of invasive lobular carcinoma and multiple studies on contrast enhanced mammography. Dr. Covington has published over 50 peer reviewed articles and book chapters. Dr. Covington is an expert in imaging response assessment for clinical trials and is the lead radiologist for imaging response assessment at Huntsman Cancer Institute. He is also the founder and host of the Radiology Review podcast. Dr. Covington. Thank you so much. Um, speaking about imaging with lobular cancer, uh, is very important, and I was really pleased that this was uh, one of the hot topics of the recent symposium. Uh, the first three speakers, so myself, Dr. Linden, and Dr. Ulaner, spoke um, specific, specifically about imaging and had quite a bit of focus on fluoroestradiol PET imaging. We all shared uh, example cases of where this newer type of PET scan made a lot of difference for patients with lobular cancer. Then Dr. Vanda Kave uh, presented really great information on whole breast, or I mean, sorry, <laughs> I'm in the breast radiology mode, but whole body diffusion weighted MRI for lobular cancer and showed some specific use cases where MRI can detect things that probably no other imaging study is able to. And I'll touch on that briefly. Um, I also may go a little bit quicker because I want to make sure we have time for questions at the end here. Um, all right, so I, I think I'm preaching to the choir that imaging is not perfect for lobular breast cancer. Um, and in my opinion, that starts in many cases at time of screening. It starts with the first detection of lobular breast cancer. And unfortunately, lobular breast cancer is less frequently detected early on screening mammograms um, in comparison to more common ductal cancers. And then this challenge with imaging diagnosis of lobular cancer continues through every stage, um, as I'll touch on here. And I just wanted to spend a moment to point out that the detection of lobular breast cancer on mammography can be challenging in best case scenarios. Occasionally, it's very obvious and you clearly see the lobular breast cancer, but in too many cases, we can't find it. And what I'm illustrating here is a hypothetical, hypothetical cancer in the breast and showing that this cancer is very easy to see in a non-dense breast. And every imaging report on a screening mammogram in the United States will report breast density. And if you look at the report, it will say either fatty, scattered, heterogeneously, or extremely dense. And the non-dense tissue are these two on the left, the fatty and scattered breast tissue, where you see the cancers very clearly. And then the cancer becomes difficult, if not impossible, to detect as the breast density increases. And one point I really just wanted to drive home is that this is a primary problem for invasive lobular cancer meaning dense breast tissue on mammography and the limitations of screening mammography in this setting um, often sets many breast cancers off to a delayed start, meaning loss of earlier diagnosis. And this is especially true, in my opinion, for lobular breast cancers, because if they're hard to see in many cases in the best case scenario, if you add a background of dense breast tissue, it can become impossible, if not nearly impossible, to detect that type of screening at the time of screening. And that's really the time when you want to find it is on a screening mammogram before anything's palpable, before you have any sort of clinical symptom. Um, I'll move on. So once lobular breast cancer is diagnosed, um, it continues to pose some challenges for pre-surgical staging. And it's very common to have lobular breast cancers understaged and over time to step-by-step uh, -step discover that there's more than was suspected initially. And that can apply to ultrasound. It can apply to MRI. It can apply to FDG PET CT, certainly CT and bone scan as well. Lymph nodes with lobular breast cancer can be, in can be involved 
but not enlarged. And on imaging, really, we're typically looking for lymph node enlargement to cue that there's a problem. And with lobular breast cancer, it's fairly well established at this point that uh, you don't always get lymph node enlargement, even if the lobular breast cancer cells are in those lymph nodes. FDG PET-CT, this is the most standard and historically used type of PET-CT imaging for breast cancer staging. Does have reduced sensitivity for many lobular breast cancer patients. In other lobular breast cancer patients, it can work perfectly, but there's certainly a number where it misses the disease. And all of this leads to things like a high rate of having to go back to surgery for positive margins, um, having to go back and address the axillary lymph nodes for unsuspected disease, things like that. And so some general solutions to this problem, I don't think we have a perfect solution in every case, but we certainly do have solutions that would allow us to do better. And one of these potential tools is fluoroestradiol PET-CT. Um, another is increased education for radiologists on the challenges of ILC detection. Um, for example, there are certain cases that I'll look at and I'll say this, this is highly suspicious knowing how lobular breast cancer behaves, but I, I see that other radiologists have called things normal, for example, just in uh, own clinical practice. That's something that's somewhat frequent. Um, and then after you've had initial treatment and everything is uh, supposedly better and gone, uh, ILC continues to pose some problems for surveillance, meaning imaging over time to say, is cancer back or is everything good? And many of the same problems still apply. But in addition, the propensity for lobular breast cancers to metastasize to areas that are difficult to detect on imaging continue to pose problems. And this is, for example, metastases to the lining of the GI tract, um, lining of the spinal cords, cerebrospinal fluid, peritoneum, some bone lesions. Um, these are all sites that we know lobular breast cancer can spread, and they are all sites that many conventional imaging studies really struggle with. And then also there's a longer time to uh, recurrence with lobular breast cancer. And I pointed out that a lot of our imaging strategies are currently to have more intensive monitoring during the first five years. And with lobular breast cancer, that doesn't necessarily make biological sense. And we need to stay vigilant with more intensive imaging uh, for longer based on uh, available data, in my opinion. Um, so again, uh, we do have some imaging technologies that can help here. I'll show some examples in a minute. And then I'll put another plug out there for circulating tumor DNA. It may be that non-imaging methods are really able to improve how we uh, approach surveillance for lobular breast cancer. And if a test like circulating tumor DNA starts to become concerning, that may be the ideal time to start applying more aggressive imaging. Um, so how can we improve ILC detection? Well, first we need to leverage every technological advance available to us. Um, the way we've historically done things are not necessarily the way we should continue to do things. And as new technologies come out, I think we need a little quicker path to implementation um, especially for patients with lobular breast cancer. And this means, uh, for example, wider use of breast MRI, whether abbreviated or full protocol, wider use of contrast enhanced mammography compared to our standard mammography, um, wider use of other technologies, uh, for example, molecular breast imaging, whole breast ultrasound, breast CT could have a lot of promise. And then for systemic imaging, wider use of fluoroestradiol PET CT and MRI in many cases. So I'm going to show a couple examples in, a cu in the last few minutes I'll speak. Um, this on the right is an example of a molecular breast imaging exam. This technology is not widely available everywhere, but um, centers like Mayo Clinic have been using this for quite some time with good results. And this is an example of a mammogram with dense breast tissue that fails to show this very extensive what was shown to be lobular breast cancer in the superior right breast. This very clearly depicted on the molecular breast imaging study. Here's an example of a contrast enhanced mammogram showing very much the same thing. This also ended up being a lobular breast cancer in the upper outer right breast that is seen on the contrast enhanced mammogram images 
and very definitely not seen on the standard mammogram images. Um, here's an example of diffusion weighted MRI, which was expertly covered in detail. And one area where diffusion weighted MRI can really shine is in the bowel and the peritoneum. Then you see these brighter areas where you have these arrows are pointing to bowel and peritoneal metastases that simply will never be detected on, for example, the left here standard CT images. Um, I want to show a couple examples of oroestradiol PET imaging. These are both from my own study that specifically is evaluating oroestradiol PET CT, specifically for patients with lobular breast cancer. And in this case, the FDG PET CT did show a couple lymph nodes that were known to be positive for lobular breast cancer, but what it entirely missed are all of these scattered dots here, which were mostly all sites of bone metastases. There were over 100 that were not identified on the FDG that FDS can clearly depict, as well as many additional lymph nodes. Um, another example of FDG on here showing no metastases, where the FES shows that there is extensive nodal involvement um, in the axilla and extending into the supracurricular region on the right. Um, so wider use of these technologies clearly for these two individuals made a difference, but I think for the lobular breast cancer population as a whole could also make a difference. We need more studies on this. Um, we're advancing the research, continuing to do this here. Um, at Huntsman, Dr. Ulener will also publish data very soon, and he presented some of that at the conference on FES for staging of ER-positive breast cancers, including lobular breast cancer. There are many people that are becoming increasingly interested in this area, which is great. Um, so in summary, we need to be willing to kind of shake things up. Um, we must use new technologies and we must get them out in a uh, quicker manner to patient care. And to do that, we'll require more studies with lobular breast cancer patients, more support, more funding for imaging research with lobular breast cancer. And I think as we continue to implement technologies that have a higher likelihood of detecting lobular breast cancer, this will translate into improved patient management. It will translate to earlier detection of lobular breast cancer at screening, improved staging before surgery. So we reduce these surprise larger lobular breast cancers that were unknown prior to surgery and improved monitoring both to give a confident negative that everything is clear as well as improved early detection if lobular breast cancer does pop up again. And um, I'll go ahead and end there. Happy to answer more questions at the end. Thanks so much, Dr. Covington. Um, we are all for shaking things up and uh, thank you for some guidance on where and how we might pursue that. Um, it's now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Priscilla McAuliffe, who will be discussing the clinical treatment science presented at the symposium. Dr. McAuliffe is a breast surgical oncologist at UPMC Maggie Women's Hospital, UPMC Hillman Cancer Center, and an assistant professor of surgery at the Department of Surgery at the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine. She received her medical degree from Weill Cornell University and completed general surgery residency at the University of Florida. Also at the University of Florida, she earned a PhD in molecular genetics. She completed fellowship in complex general surgical oncology, as well as a postdoctoral research fellowship at the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center. She leads clinical and translational research for breast surgical diseases at the University of Pittsburgh UPMC Hillman Cancer Center. Her research interests include invasive lobular carcinoma, reduction of low value surgery, and pre-invasive breast neoplasms, including DCIS and LCIS. Dr. McAuliffe. Well, I really appreciate the opportunity to uh, cover the sessions on the um, challenges in the treatment of ILC and um, in local treatment. 
And so as you can see here, this covers six different investigators who talked for a total of two hours, and I have approximately 15 minutes to cover that, which means about two and a half minutes per session, of which every 20 minutes was uh, priceless. But I will do my best. I am going to switch a little bit between the um, the topics that the speakers covered in order to tell a more cohesive story. But I will try very hard to identify uh, where the information that I'm talking about comes from. So the first um, presentation was a really powerful one by a breast cancer researcher who had uh, recently been diagnosed herself with lobular cancer. She did talk a little bit about uh, her work looking at uh, chromatin, but really the main focus was kind of an overarching description of the fact that it's a long road when you're suddenly the patient, uh, but really her message was a very positive one, talking about the goal to bring precision medicine to all moments of lobular um, care. And uh, the next speaker was uh, Dr. Moabi, who um, is a medical oncologist at uh, MD Anderson. And um, he began his talk by looking at um, a comparison between various clinical factors of uh, ductal cancer and comparing it to lobular cancer. So one of the comments he made was that more patients with lobular cancer, as we know, are diagnosed at a later stage. But overall, the majority of patients, thankfully, are identified at an earlier stage. About 80% uh, of patients with lobular cancer are diagnosed um, at stage one or two, whereas that number is about 90% for, for ductal cancer. But for that reason, I'm going to step away from his talk for a moment to kind of talk about the way that uh, patients, the majority of patients with lobular cancer are treated, which is oftentimes with surgery first when they have a more early stage disease. And that brings us to Rita Mukdar's talk about the surgical management of lobular cancer. Um, she did talk a little bit about imaging, but of course I'm not gonna cover that uh, because uh, that was Dr. Covington's a uh, portion that he just covered, but um, she did talk about the known fact that patients with lobular cancer have worse surgical outcomes compared to patients with ductal cancer based on positive margin rate, which means that there's not a rim of normal healthy breast tissue around where the lobular cancer is, and also because of increased mastectomy rates. And the causes that she mentioned for those included the higher stage of presentation, um, like uh, Jason mentioned, as well as the discordance with imaging that Dr. Covington uh, mentioned. And so uh, given those facts, should a patient with lobular cancer always choose mastectomy? The answer to that was not necessarily. And she specifically commented on two studies looking at a very large number of patients uh, admittedly not all with lobular cancer, but overall showed the same or better outcome um, with survival with breast conservation, which means lumpectomy plus radiation compared to the alternative of mastectomy. And uh, she did make a comment that a lot goes into the decision-making that a surgeon has, whether the patient is going to undergo uh, breast conservation therapy versus mastectomy. And that includes uh, the status of the lymph node, which has uh, implications related to reconstruction and long-term sequela. So um, she focused then on the consequences of a positive margin. And one is when there's a positive margin, the goal is to get a negative margin. So generally a person will have a re-excision go back to the operating room to remove more tissue to try to achieve that. So of course, with the more surgeries that you have, the more potential that there can be a side effect, an infection, seroma, hematoma, or fat necrosis. And of course, with more breast tissue removed, the contour of the breast can change and then that can affect a woman's satisfaction in the way her breast looks after surgery, which then can lead to issues related to sexual well-being. And of course, with each surgery that's done, 
healthcare costs can increase. And um, she also talked about the risk of recurrence if negative margins are not achieved, which is worse than if negative margins are achieved. And so she covered a lot of work that uh, she had specifically done looking at uh, the surgical management of patients with lobular cancer. And she asked the question, if a positive margin occurs, what's the chance of success for reexcision in lobular cancer? And thankfully, a good success rate was found. She also uh, spoke about some other uh, issues, but in the interest of time, I'll jump right to her summary, which is that breast conservation therapy is safe for patients with lobular cancer, even when there's a larger extent of lobular cancer that needs to be removed. But the key thing is to uh, do the best we can to achieve a negative margin. And she spoke about different uh, oncoplastic and sometimes plastic surgical techniques that can be used to recontour the shape of the breast so that the cosmesis of the breast can be adequate, um, either by using tissue rearrangement or more extensive uh, surgical procedures. She also mentioned the fact that as tumors uh, of lobular cancer get larger, that even with mastectomy, there can be high positivity rates. And so uh, that can be an issue as well, which has implications related to reconstruction as well as radiation. And really the takeaway point that um, Dr. Mukhtar made was that we really have a way to go with, as Dr. Covington said, a uh, better need for imaging so that we know what we're dealing with prior to bringing the patient to the operating room but also better systemic therapy um, for lobular cancer to potentially try to shrink tumors preoperatively. And then of course, um, systemic treatment for overall improvement of survival. So the next talk was actually mine. And I saw that someone on the chat had asked this question. And um, so the reason why we're interested not only in the cancer which is within the breast, but also the underarm lymph nodes on the same side is because knowing whether there's cancer in the underarm lymph nodes helps us to best accurately stage the breast cancer, which then helps us understand the prognosis because the higher the stage, the worse the prognosis and the lower the stage, the better the prognosis. And that in turn then helps determine the extent of multiple things whether um, the extent of the oncologic surgery, whether reconstruction will be needed, um, how much radiation is needed, as well as systemic therapy, whether it's given before or after surgery. So why can axillary nodal surgery be a problem? Because there can be significant morbidities with um, any sort of surgery on lymph nodes, including paresthesias and lymphedema, which is what that a picture is showing. And this is especially important because we know that there's not a significant impact on a relapse for your overall survival from studies that were done up to 25 years ago. And so what my uh, talk focused on was the current data, which uh, was done on clinical trials, but that included um, ductal and lobular cancer focusing on the lobular component of each of those studies. This is especially important because we know that the lobular histology independently predicts the risk of micrometastatic axillary disease. So in the interest of time, I'll get cut right to the chase, to the takeaway message. And there are exceptions to what I'm going to say. There's not one answer, but in general, if a patient has a normal underarm on physical exam and on imaging, sentinel lymph node biopsy, which is a procedure to identify the first or first few lymph nodes that are responsible for the breast, if those are removed with a sentinel lymph node biopsy, sometimes that's all that's needed. Once that lymph node is removed, we'll get a surgical result from that. And if there's no cancer in that lymph node, then most of the time, no further axillary surgery is needed. If there's a low volume of disease, which means approximately one to three lymph nodes involved, then, um, uh, extensive removal of all the lymph nodes, which is called axillary lymph node dissection, is generally not uh, recommended. But if there's high volume of lymph node involvement, then removal of the lymph nodes that are responsible for the breast, which is called the axillary lymph node uh, dissection, is recommended. 
So what about for patients who, when they first come because of imaging uh, difficulties, et cetera, who are known when they come to have cancer in the underarm lymph nodes um, on physical exam and imaging, and most of the time um, identified or, or clarified with a percutaneous biopsy. So in general, axillary lymph node dissection is recommended for those patients, although in appropriately selected patients, sometimes neoadjuvant uh, therapy prior to surgery can help us to avoid axillary lymph node dissection. But the key point is that we still have a ways to go with right-sizing axillary surgical management. So uh, the next study that was um, presented by uh, Julia Foldy from uh, my institution at the University of Pittsburgh, looked at pulling out the information about lobular cancer in four uh, clinical trials from the NSABP, the National Surgical Adjuvant Breast and Bowel Project. So the reason why these studies were picked was because randomized clinical trials helps us to get the most uh, high quality information about how patients are treated. And so what she found was that in looking through these four large trials that encompassed over uh, 12,000 patients, about 10% of those had lobular cancer. And what she found was with a long-term follow-up of more than 10 years, a significant difference in the baseline characteristics of the patients who had lobular cancer. They were older in age, they had a higher prevalence of ER positive disease, and had more lymph node involvement and larger tumors for the reasons we've discussed earlier in this hour. But if she matched for those criteria, then really there was no difference in the clinical outcome of disease-free survival, overall survival, or recurrence with the systemic treatment. But another really important point that she found was that while early on for the first five years, patients with lobular cancer do better overall, later on, they have a tendency to do worse. And um, she noted that the patterns were similar if the disease was estrogen receptor positive or estrogen receptor negative. And so then this dovetails right back into Dr. Muabi's talk, who spoke about the goal of identifying better ways to help us understand how patients with lobular cancer will do. So not only looking at the uh, histology, but also looking at biomarkers, genetic alteration, transcri transcri transcriptomic features, and the tumor microenvironment. And I wish I had more time to go over this, but essentially he used tissue from uh, two data sets and performed uh, various analyses that included a considerably large number of patients with lobular cancer. And he was able to show um, with his results that just looking at the histology uh, was not as good as looking at both the histology plus molecular features. He also spoke about the tumor microenvironment. So you have the tumor cell, but it's also living in an environment that includes uh, the immune system and the surrounding tissue, which is called the stroma. And he spoke about a particular assay where um, the immune uh, enhancement was assessed and uh, the work that he's currently doing, looking at this assay, which has been reported in some other cancer types, but specifically with breast cancer, excuse me, with lobular cancer, to uh, be able to understand if uh, survival um, and prognosis can be predicted, but with the overall goal to personalize care. And I just wanted to step back for a minute to the talk that uh, Dr. Simpson gave at the beginning of this hour related to the focus on lobular carcinoma in situ. It wasn't one of the uh, studies to present here, so I'm not gonna mention any more, except wouldn't it be wonderful if lobular pathology could be managed before it was even invasive? And so I'm gonna finish with the question of what can you do right now and the answer is exercise. And that's important for whatever point of your lobular cancer journey you might be on. And we heard a wonderful talk from Katie Schmidt uh, talking about her experience um, with uh, helping us to understand that uh, exercise is critical. 
for reducing cancer-related fatigue, sleep, quality of life, all the things that you see written on this slide here, exercise helps with these. How? By improving uh, or reducing inflammation, by helping with comorbidities, and to reduce frailty. And um, she did mention her seminal work on um, lymphedema. It used to be thought that if a patient develops lymphedema, that they should um, try to minimize movement. But her work um, showed that actually exercise gives a much better outcome for patients with lobular cancer. So it was exciting to hear her thoughts on that topic. So what is the best recommendation? So um, she gave um, guidelines from various uh, uh, institutions, the American College of Sports Medicine, American Cancer Society, and the American Society of Clinical Oncology. But really the point is, while ideally five hours a week would be wonderful of aerobic activity and then two times a week from resistance, but we don't get to that overnight. And if you spend your day sitting in a chair, then just taking a few laps around the dining room table is the way to start um, because this can seem somewhat overwhelming. And she did uh, talk about intensity, which I thought was really interesting. She said, for sure, gone are the days of don't push yourself, take it easy, stay in bed. But she also talked about the talk test to judge intensity. So if you're exercising so hard that you cannot talk, you're working too hard. But if you can sing, then you're not working hard enough. And so, um, but her data is clear that exercise really helps um, patients who are going through a lobular breast cancer journey. So my quick take on these two sessions is that we um, are always working toward improving precision treatment for lobular cancer in all the clinical areas. Thank you very much. Thank you, Priscilla, for that fantastic talk. And I'm getting ready for my singing run after this session. Um, and it's great to see, I think all of us will uh, be really pleased to hear about precision and more personalized medicine in the clinical setting for lobular and seeing clinical advances for patients. So thank you, that's fantastic. Um, we're going to be moving on to the question and answer session now. Thank you, everyone. You've sent lots of questions through. Obviously, we can't answer them all. We also can't answer personal clinical treatment questions. Those questions that we don't tackle that aren't personal treatment related in this question and answer session, we will collect them all and collate them and we'll make sure that the written responses are done for people. But um, for, before we start, I just want to introduce our co-moderator, Jason Mwabi. Jason is Assistant Professor of Oncology in the Department of Breast Medical Oncology at the University of Texas, MD Anderson Cancer Center, Houston, Texas. He's a research interest focused on highlighting the differences between invasive lobular carcinoma and invasive ductal carcinoma. He also works to understand the ILC tumor microenvironment at the cellular, molecular, and genetic levels to identify promising therapeutics that can be studied in clinical trials to help advance the care of people with ILC. So welcome to welcome to the help us moderate the Q&A session, Jason. So we thought we'd just kick off. Um, obviously, we've covered a huge amount in, in just the time we've been online. Um, and we wanted to invite Pete and Patrick, um, in terms of the basic biology of lobular, what do you think are the key patient takeaways of new knowledge in basic science for lobular? So you want me to start, Claire? Uh, either you or Pete, I don't mind, whichever of you like to go first. Okay, well, maybe I can give my, my, my first two cents on this. I, I think we've been chipping away at the biochemistry of this disease now for the past 15 years. And although uh, we're not there yet, um, we have got a good understanding of what is happening um, in these cells. And as uh, Dr. Ramaswamy was saying, ecoherin is not enough, but it's certainly the main driver and uh, more um, emphasis should be put on uh, research uh, to understand what is the driving biochemistry once you lose cell-cell contacts um, in lobular breast cancer. 
I think we understand better now um, the subgroups of breast cancers, which is ecadherin positive lobular breast cancers, and that they might um, define a subgroup within lobulars that will respond differently to certain targeted treatments. Um, and we've learned that the mouse models have become very useful in understanding uh, treatment rationales, and they have formed the basis for two intervention trials that are ILC specific in Europe. So I think those are the biggest takeaways um, from my end. Thanks, Patrick. And Pete, what, what would you be yours? Uh, yeah, so thanks, Patrick. That's a, a good summary. I, I agree with what you say. I think we need to, um, there's a lot of molecular data now accumulating for lobular breast cancer, and it's about trying to correlate those um, really detailed molecular understandings to the, kind of the clinical information that we get with patients, whether it's response to treatment or long-term outcome. So co correlating those kind of d deep molecular features that we're discovering with, with clinical uh, findings. So we, we can then see what's prognostic, what is inherently treatable um, to make an impact to, for the patient. Yes, and we also a very important role of educating, I think, uh, the clinicians in that sense, because we find some very counterintuitive things using the biochemistry and, and the modeling. For instance, um, we've seen that ILC cells are very susceptible for drugs to target PI3 kinase AKT, whereas in a clinic, you will not get these drugs if you're not mutant for them. Um, and that's just one example. Uh, the same goes for the low proliferation and the very high susceptibility towards CDK4-6 inhibitors. These are things that we really need to trickle through to, through the clinic in order to be implemented in, in daily clinical practice and even think about doing this as a first-line defense and not just in the metastatic setting. One of the questions we had as well that um, was asking you, could you explain a bit more about the potential for the combination of CDK4-6 and AKT inhibitors? Yeah, so this is all very experimental and preclinical, I have to say, although the individual um, interventions using a CDK4-6 inhibitor and AKT drugs have proven successful in clinic, of course. It's the unexpected combination that seems to be successful in lobular models that may be promising for future interventions. So the idea is that these cells are very low, low proliferative, and after a long time, they might relapse and start proliferating really fast. And this will be the time to use these CDK4-6 inhibitors to try and get them dormant again. Um, that should be enough, but in daily practice, that is not enough and cells will relapse again. And I think that the dependency on this growth factor receptor activation, which multiple groups have shown, including ours, um, is an Achilles heel of lobular breast cancer. Giving them at the same time will clinically not fly, I think, uh, but uh, we might want to do um, intervention trials by stacking them on top of each other. So start with a CDK4-6 inhibitor, and then if there is a relapse, uh, come back with the uh, drugs that target AKT um, molecules. Thank you. And just a really quick question, just because I'm conscious we've got, we're doing a lay audience. Just can you summarize really quickly what a mouse model is, just in case everybody doesn't realize mouse models? Really quickly, that is really challenging. So um, long story short, you have a couple of different mouse models. You can either transplant cells into mice, it being a mouse breast cancer cell line or a human breast cancer cell line and study growth in a mouse, or you can knock out certain genes in the mouse and then look at actual tumor development and progression. And we're doing all of the above. Fabulous, thank you, Patrick. So oh, Pete and Patrick, I have a, a two quick questions for you. Um, first, around LobSig validation that you talked about, um, what what more has to be done, and what will that allow in terms of prediction? Um, and my other question is about pathology, so I'll wait, let you answer. Um, yeah, thanks for the opportunity to talk about LobSig. Um, we're validating um, with external collaborators. Um, so one of the, the things that we're concerned about with how good this test might be is that we, we have done the work ourselves and we haven't validated with other people. So we're in the midst of collaborating with a group in Nottingham to see whether um, we can recapitulate the same things in a, in a different 
data set with different patients treated in a di different hospital. And, and, and since my talk in Pittsburgh, we've um, opened conversations with other people around the world as well, which is really nice to see if we can um, extend the validation to other cohorts in, in, in different centers. So that's really the key thing for us is to see um, if we can see the same findings in different data sets. And can you just recap the finding that you're trying to validate? With yeah, it? so we, out, out of the gene signature, there was 194 genes. Um, we've actually started to look at some of these uh, genes using immunohistochemistry in the same way that ER and PR and HER2 and E could hear and are studied in tissue sections. And we've um, identified um, two proteins in particular which look very prognostic in, in, in our data sets, which we're exploring uh, with these collaborators. So it's about looking for it, um, two proteins, two to four proteins in tissue sections. Can I ask a question at all? Go ahead. Just one, uh, Dr. Simpson, I mean, wouldn't that, would you be able to just enroll patients who are, you know, on the clinical setting is going to get oncotype and you can also do lab sick and then you can continue to follow them. Would that be, a, you know, you're going to need a prospective study to show this is actually really prognostic. So would that be feasible in uh, in, yeah. in Europe? Uh, yes, you're right. Um, so things like oncotype um, has been studied in a prospective manner to see how useful they are for predicting um, treatment um, management and, and prognosis and so yeah that's a that's a big um, task we, we need a large prospective study with long-term follow-up so that's something that we'll have to think about carefully with the community once we've seen the same effects in these other retrospective cohorts but yes prospective study is very important and, and a long-term thing for sure so shifting to um, pathology, um, you, you both, I think, touched on that um, AI is, is becoming more of more used in looking at pathology, at tissue. And, um, and I'm wondering whether you see it used in tandem and then replacing the human eye looking through a microscope for um, determining the pathology of a cancer tumor? Uh, so certainly not replacing the human eye, but but um, being used as a, a support tool, probably, <clears throat> particularly in the early stages of development, um, has to be used as a support tool to experts that, that know what they're looking at. But, but, but the AI can pick up really interesting features that um, is difficult by the human eye. And so, and so there's data from George Reese Filo and colleagues <clears throat> where you can predict, I think this is right, that you look at the tissue section and you can predict that that particular cancer has a weak adherent mutation. So you can, you can use AI looking at tissue sections to uncover molecular features without studying the molecular features. So it, it really is very powerful. And, um, and pretty exciting for the future. We need lots of validation for sure. That's great, thanks. Jason, if you've got anything you, you, you would like to ask. So to the, to the whole panel, I mean, I'm looking at the questions. There's a few interesting questions. Uh, one of them is about uh, ER negativity. So at diagnosis, if you have PR negativity, does that uh, indicate like a poorer outcome? Uh, these are questions I hear a lot in the clinic, so it's important to to clarify those. Uh, if anybody wants to take it, if not, I can I can answer that as well. I, I think that does correlate with the poor outcome, Jason. And I think Rita yes. showed recently that a PR positive, sorry, an ER positive, PR negative cancer doesn't respond as well to endocrine therapy. 
if I understand correctly. Yes. And I think, you know, that belongs a little bit more to the luminal bees. So I think at least it's an indication. I'm not saying every one of them will be, but, you know, I think they definitely show less estrogenic uh, response, anti-estrogenic response. And the other question is AR positivity. What does it indicate in lobular? AR? AR, androgen receptor. Androgen receptor. <laughs> it's a good question. I, I'm afraid I won't be able to answer that. We don't clinically do that, of course. And um, we do it only for our triple negative patients, metastatic biopsies. All of them have a, a AR done. And I have had patients who has responded very nicely with anti-estrogens, just simple pill to take uh, for a triple negative. Clearly, they're much uh, inter more indolent than usual. But I'm, I, I'm not sure about the uh, significance in a lobular cancer. And one more question, and it's another question that's very common. We hear about what's the role of tumor markers, CA-15-3 and CA-27-29. And I would add one question to it. Do, we, do anybody routinely use it in their practice? I don't use it. At a, I don't use it except in a very rare circumstances where, you know, it's just maybe not, nothing visible, which does happen in lobular cancers. Um, you know, and uh, so I've tried uh, most of the times if they've just got like colon uh, lesions or maybe a couple of um, bone lesions, they, they're, none of these tumor markers are high. And uh, anyway, now they, I think they've canceled out CA-15-3. You can only order CA-27-29. I don't know whether it's, it's institutional or it's national, um, but either which way, I, I rarely do it. I think it just adds to the, the anxiety with the patients because for us, it's just too, you know, it'll be like it goes from 29 to 32. That's nothing. And we'll just say it's nothing and walk away, but they go home and think they have three more cancer cells. And so, you know, just that, I feel like I'm only doing a disservice to them if I do it in every patient that I scan every three months anyway, so. Yes, I agree. It's important to not, unlike CEA and other uh, tumor uh, marker and other type of cancers for uh, lob like CA-15-3 and CA-27-29 are not sensitive nor specific when it comes to breast cancer. Thank you. We've um, had another question, Matt. This is the, we've had a couple of questions for yourself actually around, obviously around imaging, imaging being a huge issue um, for many patients. And one is what imaging um, patients should be asking for after five or 10 years of hormone treatment um, for, for monitoring. Um, and it, obviously this depends which country we're in because there's different levels of monitoring depending on health services. So what, what are your kind of thoughts on, on that question for patients? Yeah, I mean, for any specific patient, that's really challenging. Um, it can even vary what imaging they'll have access to based on where they live, um, what insurance will pay for, what their oncologists want. Um, ultimately, I would say the decision on how to monitor is not something that can be dictated entirely by a radiologist, but it's a lot of also by an oncologist, you know, are there current symptoms of concern? Are there any findings on physical exam? Are, other, are there any lab markers that something might be off? Um, what I can say is generally... Um, with lobular breast cancer, I favor more sensitive imaging techniques. And for example, that would mean I would typically prioritize an FDG PET CT over a CT with bone scan, because I simply know you'll find more disease recurrence with FDG PET CT. On the other hand, I've talked to a number of oncologists who find that FDG PET CT has far too many false positives. And, you know, in some cases, shy away from that because it sends patients down, you know, these uh, pathways of having to have a lot of additional imaging, possibly biopsy for things that aren't cancer. Um, so it has to be definitely an individual discussion between patient and oncologist and what is the patient's goal? Do they prioritize, you know, highest goal of detection while accepting some risk for false positives? Um, I'm definitely looking forward in the future to seeing fluoroestradiol PET-CT based on the existing data 
which admittedly is on small patient numbers at only a few institutions, but it appears that FES PET CT has higher detection rates while also having lower false positives compared to FDG PET CT. The recent NCCN guidelines from this year have added FES PET CT. It says you can consider this for ER positive patients, but there are not a lot of really concrete guidelines on what to do. Um, so it comes down to what the goals are and your relationship with your oncologist. I'd welcome any input from others on this panel on that question because it's my point is it's not only a radiology specific question. This is more of a treatment team comprehensive question. What's the best imaging strategy for a specific patient? So, so Dr. Covington, I have one comment and question. You know, I was one of those who was so excited to see this FES scan being, you know, kind of thought about and because it's such an important question, sometimes you don't see this disease. But the the, the frustrating part of all of this is that you, there is uptake in the liver and uptake in the entire bowel that the whole idea is to find those hiding spaces. It's not a big difficulty finding, you know, on a CT scan, some spots or a bone scan, some spots. It's some of those who are present just with colonic or small bowel disease that we can't see at all. But now on the FES PET scans, you just see it's it's all black. So there's no real, real advantage is there to do this. So, I mean, you've mentioned, you know, it's liver, biliary tree, small bowel has a lot of uptake. On the other hand, bone, you know, breast, lymph node, lung is very good in those areas. So it's, you have to know the limitations of every imaging study. FDG certainly has its own. Um, for the liver and bowel, it, you know, and this was presented at the symposium, MRI is superior there. So if that's the pri primary concern, you know, there's GI symptoms, for example, mm -hmm. abdominal pain, then that would be tailored to say, let's see what, what's the best MRI scan we can get for you because we think that's the ideal imaging strategy. Okay, great. Thank you. I would add that we really have to also consider the um, presenting stage of the patient when and, and the final pathologic stage. Remember, we spoke about the fact that many patients uh, present actually with very early stage disease, and they generally don't need a systemic um, imaging follow-up. By that, I mean CAT scan, FES scan, et cetera. Um, but of course, if they have breast tissue, they should have at minimum standard screening mammography, but oftentimes a recommendation in somebody who has a history of lobular cancer to consider to be screened going forward with a breast MRI. But if there is no more breast tissue and somebody has had early stage disease, sometimes no follow-up imaging is necessary. So there really is a big range to uh, Dr. Covington's point that it really is an individual patient decision. Thanks, Priscilla. And one of the areas you also mentioned, I was get, kind of picking up on breast imaging, is contrast enhanced mam mammogram. And could you just mention that the status of the CMIS trial for contrast enhanced mammogram? And if you think it's likely to become a standard of care for breast imaging in the future, particularly sure. with ILC? Um, the CMIS trial is not specific to lobular breast cancer, but it will image about 2,000 patients with dense breast tissue for screening. Um, the first patient was enrolled in May, so it's just getting going. Um, I think they're anticipating results sometime in 2025, and as we know with research, that's uh, maybe uh, prone to get pushed back as well. So we're going to have to wait a couple years to see the final results. However, based on existing data, you can predict that it's going to show similar results to MRI, maybe not quite as good, but it should be similar. That, that's what you would predict the study will show. And what that could do is provide an especially great alternative to MRI. Um, not everybody is willing or can tolerate an MRI exam. And so then what do you do? You know. Uh, contrast enhanced mammography is generally an exam that's potentially more accessible, cheaper, easier tolerated than MRI that may perform similar. And the CMIS trial will be a multi-center perspective trial that will have some really useful data 
Um, will this become standard of care? I certainly hope so in some way. That doesn't mean that everybody will get a contrast enhanced mammogram every year. But if we can identify those patients who are most likely to benefit from that and uh, have them undergo a contrast enhanced mammogram compared to the standard mammogram, we certainly would improve the accuracy of breast cancer detection in dense breasts. In addition to other technologies, CEM is not the only game here. There's multiple technologies, but it is one of the most promising ones. Thank you. Jason. How about the other uh, treatment modalities like the FAPI and uh, the, the other uh, radio tracer? Uh, are they ready for prime time for globular or there still needs to be research? Uh, so FAPI is fibroblast activating protein. Sometimes it's FAP, sometimes FAPI if people want to look it up. It has a lot of excitement in the nuclear medicine community. It has for a number of years now because um, people are approaching it as if it might be a superior cancer staging exam for many cancers um, than FDG. It might have fewer false positives. It might be more sensitive. It has less uptake in areas like the brain normally, so it would make it easier to see sites of disease in, in organs compared to FDG. Another potential advantage of this type of PET imaging is you can also tie a therapeutic agent in theory to it. So you could use FAP to both diagnose and then subsequently treat using injected radioactivity. Um, there are a number of similar PET tracers also coming through. In fact, I'd say that we're at a renaissance right now of PET radiopharmaceutical research, and it's called Theranostics. Um, where you have a PET agent for diagnosis, and then it's tied to an additional therapeutic radioactive agent that can be injected after for therapy. This is in current clinical practice for prostate cancer with PSMA PET and Pluvicto. It's also in current clinical practice for neuroendocrine tumors with various forms of Dotatate PET and then Ludothera. And it, in my view is just becoming apparent to a lot of these companies that breast cancer patients could also benefit from this. We're seeing all kinds of interest at our institution, and I'm hearing through the pipeline at near, nearly every cancer center is starting to have many trials with these agents, including a lot of early discussion on breast cancer. So I do think um, what you bring up is a great point, and that this will have benefit not only for diagnostics, but therapeutics for breast cancer patients. Is there any lobular specific trial going on in this area? I'm not sure. I'm not aware that there is, um, but this is kind of the start, and I anticipate this will be something that will deserve more discussion in coming years. Uh, another clinical question. Uh, if one aromatase inhibitor uh, does not work, does other one work or it's a class effect that is not gonna work? Did you say CDK, CDK for no, six? Aroma, endocrine therapy, aromatase inhibitors. So if one patient was started on an aromatase inhibitor and it's not giving the effectiveness that is expected, does changing to another one, does it restore activity? I mean, the only reason, I mean, we change that end, uh, endocrine therapy from one, say, for example, aromatase inhibitor to another aromatase inhibitor. And sometimes we might even to go to tamoxifen is more for tolerability. But in the metastatic setting, if by chance we start them on first line AI therapy, which is very rare these days, we almost always give them with CDK4-6. But even in those de novo disease, and we say we just do AI, we usually then do you know circulating tumor DNA, see whether there's an ESR mutation, and see whether we need to change therapy. So, yeah. Thank you for mentioning tamoxifen. I think it's very important to highlight, given that there is a lot of lobular here. It's not that tamoxifen does not work for lobular. Yeah. We, we 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 just say that aromatase inhibitors are better if you have both options. But tamoxifen still works, so so it's wrong to say it does not work. And, and I hear a lot of uh, of those comments on social media and at meetings that people are scared of taking out tamoxifen because they think it doesn't work for lobular. 
this is not true. Um, we, we always say if you have both option, one is better than the other, but both work. All right. And one uh, person had yeah. some question. They said the doctor said that everybody needs to do a genetic testing. No, I didn't say that. I think if you have uh, say bilateral ILC and you're very young, less than 45, or you have a very strong family history of lobular cancer, and maybe somebody in your family have also had gastric cancer, the particular subtype. I think these are the people who needs to also, who needs to be tested for germline CDH mutation. So you, I think most of you would have, depending on your risk factors these days, which have been really relaxed, would have gotten tested for general you know, panel of which includes like the BRCA1, BRCA2, PALB2, check to all of those, and you would get that. Um, but, uh, and if you have BRCA1 or BRCA2, you don't need to test for CDH1. Germline mutation, the one that you got from your parents, not the one in your tumor, that will be testing anyway. Thank you. I think it's also important to answer the, the question about the uh, dissection, uh, Dr. Priscilla. So the question is, if there is two, two more or, or more lymph nodes uh, or two lymph nodes involved, does the patient always have to do X dissection? So the um, in the upfront surgery setting, we have at least three uh, randomized clinical trials that look at patient with low volume disease in the axilla. And if there's two or fewer lymph nodes that have cancer, um, the studies have shown that uh, axillary lymph node dissection does not give any further benefit. Um, and so for the low volume disease, we don't generally proceed with axillary lymph node dissection, although there are exceptions to everything as there always is in clinical medicine. Thank you, everyone. We've we've covered a huge amount in this session, um, and thank you for everyone involved. We're, we're very conscious how busy you are, both in clinic and in your labs, and having this opportunity for patients to hear the latest research in lay terms. It's important, I think, for I think often there's there's a message that patients hear that lobular is is misunderstood and there's nothing happening. So it's fantastic to see your, your commitment, your energy. Uh, the change in research, the changes in, in in clinical practice and your passion for making sure that that change develops. And I think that's something that really came across in the symposium and also that as collaborating together as clinicians, researchers and patient advocates. So thank you to everyone who came along today and listened. Thank you for your questions. We'll respond to your questions afterwards. And thank you again for the panel for a really interesting presentations.